Aloha, aloha, aloha. Welcome to the sixth Body, Soil, and this year Animal Health Conference. Aina is a connectivity, a conne uh, not just an, a, a connectivity to place, but to spirit. Because in everything that surrounds us, it is alive. It is to whom we look to as our inspiration. Our, um, in, uh, in our history, Hawaiian history, the Kalo, for example, is our older sibling. It is that intimate, the relationship we have with our land. It is beyond just sustenance. It is the source in which we gather every essence of our be being in our physical, our mental, our emotional and spiritual states. I'm an organic farmer. Actually, I'm an orgasmic farmer. Um, that goes beyond organic. It really does. You know, Aloha Aina is something that uh, is close to my heart and uh, because it, it's directly associated with how we take care of ourselves along with how we take care of the land. So that relationship with the land is so important and critical. I was inspired in my, in my farming practices by, by being around Uncle Harry Mitchell and Kay and I. And uh, I invoke his spirit today. Uh, Uncle passed, passed away uh, back in the 90s. But his spirit lives on very strong. He was a taro farmer and I had a wonderful opportunity to work with him. And my grandfather, Vincenzo Labate, he, uh, he was a big inspiration for me. And, uh, you know, what I, what I like to build with, with the conferences is to have a conceptual type of conference, that, and like what we're going to have this weekend. I just have total confidence in the speakers that are here today and the presenters, and they're, not only that they're my friends, but also knowing who they are and what they, what they do in their lives and what they stand for in their lives. For me, what I, what I see is the, the true investment that you folks made today wasn't your registration. You know, it was, it's, it's the investment is when you leave this conference, how that will show up in what you do to, in your daily life, the inspiration that you pull from this conference, hopefully, and how you can implement that in your daily life. Thanks for the honor of inviting me back. It was great to be here last year. And, uh, you know, I come from the other end of the earth, Pennsylvania, which is, um, which is still a farm state. And, uh, and it's probably a still a farm state because we still have uh, some semblance of community. It's those Amish Mennonite families that live there that have held the land. What I'm seeing, if there's any, any message from those people, it's not that we have to necessarily go back and live with kerosene lanterns and farm with horses. It's the fact that if we're going to fix what's broken and sustain that which we do fix, whether it's our our own family's health or the health of what we leave for the future. And I think that's what this kind of a conference is about. It's not about us. It's about what we leave for the future because we're not here very long and that's a given. So what, it's, what is it really all about? If you just talk about sustainability, it's about posterity as, and, and having a good time creating um, a sustainable posterity in the, in the interim. And I think if there's any message that I've learned in the last, I've been in this work since 1979. I've been in agriculture since 19. 68 
And, um, and I've seen what's happened to the um, American way of, of living and farming uh, and the connectedness of, of, that, of that shortfall in that last 30 some odd years of the fact, like Will said, the biggest contributor to the problems we have relative to the environment is agriculture. And so what I have seen is the fact that, you know, when we start dealing with issues like um, what is medicine, uh, what is community, uh, what is food, uh, what is, you know, what is the real word of sustainability? And I think the, the real connection for me is that specific word is connectedness. Um, and that you understand these things are, when you talk about holistic, it's not about, and Will said this the other day, holistic doesn't mean alternative methods of healing a, a, an animal. Holistic means encompassing, you know, the entire whole principles that the natural world has so generously provided and that we've so um, arrogantly have dismissed because it can't be sexy enough if it's that easily available. So I'm, I'm going to talk about big picture stuff. Where the trends have been, in effect, exemplified in the past, we're recognizing that, in effect, what we have been doing lately at high breakneck speed has been going on for a long time and it's been documented. Um, Louder Milk's work from the National Resource Conservation Service uh, did a great job on, on showing the civilizations that have collapsed simply because we don't recognize that topsoil is an organism and the erosion of topsoil is, is such a severe issue uh, today that if you want to talk about global warming, just talk about topsoil loss and there's your answer to, to global warming. And the, and the resurrection of, of, of stopping that, that demise, that erosion of everything is associated with losing topsoil. And that's been going on for a long, long time. So I talk about that, how that relates to what we can do as individuals, what we can do collectively as farming um, communities as well as collective communities. And then how that translates also into the human health arena, which now we are on a collision course with, you know, the the epidemics of uh, childhood obesity and diabetes, cancer, arthritis, Alzheimer's, and all the plagues that are associated with this fundamental problem of not really farming uh, as stewards, but farming as miners and farming as exploiters. So I'm a big picture kind of person, and like Vincent said, I think what you'll get hopefully out of these are dots that you can connect, and there's some, there's some can-dos and how-tos on this, but I think the real important part is the the interconnectedness of all these issues, and they're, they're not that difficult to understand. This is not Greek uh, in, a, in a Chinese culture. This is, this is really good, easy to understand, makes sense kind of stuff. So uh, I, I guess I'm... That, I'm, that was an Italian <laughs> one-minute introduction. <laughs> it, so that's, that's what John, you're in actually. for. My goal is to have something happen to you that has happened to me at a conference. Uh, I had my heart cracked open at a conference in about 1980. It burst wide open. I was a conventional veterinarian uh, thinking I was doing the right thing. I went to a conference and I saw something that busted me open at this conference and I was never able to practice conventional medicine again since about 1979. Uh, and yeah, there's just no going back once that happens. So everybody's got to have a goal of coming here, right? My goal is to have, even if it's just one person in this audience, have their heart just get busted wide open and they can never go back into their, their former life. Now, my talks uh, are going to, uh, Vincent asked me to back up a little bit. I'm a veterinarian by training and by, by uh, love. It's what I love. I love talking about animals. Uh, there'll be some soil and some plant uh, material. I'm going to talk today about animal energy, how to, how to get it, how to find it, what it looks like, how to recognize it, how to recognize when it's blocked. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a, was a tiller of the ground. And uh, I, I, I talk about this because this is all about stewardship in a very metaphorical but actually very real way. I mean, uh, by the time you're done here with two days, you'll find that Will and I are real big enthusiasts of, of cover cropping, grasslands. And it's really what nature does. You never see bare ground very long in the natural world. It's just not allowed. It's a fundamental rule. Human energy consumption, uh, one of the slides that's up there is that, this is interesting, 40% of the Earth's productivity two-thirds from agriculture, uh, one-third from the loss of plant mass, which includes deforest de deforestation, desertification, erosion. And what's interesting about this is that two-thirds of agriculture is rice, wheat, and corn, period. So in other words, what they're saying is the growing of these cereal grains, predominantly three of them, are responsible for two-thirds 
of the biosphere imploding. You know, just because of the way we grow this stuff. North America in 1939, 460 million acres of cropland, 300 million were eroding, 50 million were ruined for crop production. That's in 1939. So where are we going? USDA studies. Now this is interesting. Seven inches of topsoil lost in 18 years at an 8% slope. That's cropland. If you go to grasslands or cover cropping, 96,000 years to lose the same seven inches topsoil at an 8% slope. But you never lose anything because the regeneration of the soil accelerates faster than the loss of the soil. If you go to a forest, it's a half a million years to lose seven inches of topsoil if you didn't rebuild a, a, an inch of it. So we know that this recycling of nutrients, and this is all associated with global warming because it's all about carbon. Okay, and carbon losses in the soil translate to carbon dioxide gains in the atmosphere. And what's interesting about that is that a one inch, oh, excuse me, a one percent increase in carbon in your topsoil sucks up between seven to ten tons of carbon dioxide. That's per acre. One percent increase in carbon in the soil sucks out the atmosphere, seven to ten tons of carbon dioxide per acre. So if you want to talk, that's called carbon sequestering, all right? So what's the answer to global warming? Increase the organic matter of the soil by a mere 1%, preferably a mere 5%, and you solve the global warming problem. Now, it's a big challenge, but it's not an impossible task. And, we're, you know, granted, we have to stop producing lots of CO2, but if you, if you come up with these formulas, which are how old? 1939? How many years ago did they figure this thing out from that perspective? This is the solution to global warming right here. Stop losing the topsoil by getting the roots in the soil. So I'm going to call this show Animal Energy. If you're uh, oriental, you might call it chi or ki. Uh, in India, they call it prana. But it's all the same thing. It's this electrical pulsation that's going through you. When you have an illness, and I'm going to say this about three times through this, when you have an illness, you either do not have enough energy, enough chi, or you have black chi. All illness, all pain is blocked or deficient chi. One of the questions I got, and this is kind of a burning question that everybody wants to know, everybody's got a problem, and, and you know, you, 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 you're not getting help with an animal problem that you got, a sick dog at home, and, and you don't know where to turn. You spent $10,000 on your animal, and you're just not getting help, and you don't know who to trust, and... Uh, you know, four or five people came up the break. It's like, where can I find a good vet, you know, here on the island or where I live? And uh, one, one of my first questions uh, back to them is like, well, why, do, why don't you just do it yourself? I've told you everything you need to know practically. It's all about energy. If you have a sick animal, you have blocked energy or you have inadequate energy. If you're sick or if your mother is sick or your father or your child, you have blocked energy, and you ha or you have deficient energy. So then you have to figure out, how am I going to restore that energy?